Let's build that medical brain. So today, what we're going to do is, I'm going to see if you guys know your neuroanatomy. Do you know where the stroke is based on when I tell you where the patient's symptom is? What if somebody comes with right-sided weakness with your arm weak more than your legs? Where's the, where is the stroke? Uh, right arm is more weak than your right leg. ACA? Okay. What if my leg is more weak than your arm? MCA. MCA, okay. I'm not going to say if it's correct or wrong. Um, what if I have equal weakness of arm and leg together? Where is the lesion now? MCA. MCA, if it's equal? Okay. What if I also had cranial nerve deficits? What if I had cranial nerve 3 and 4 involved on physical exam? Where is the lesion? So I see there's a lot of confusion here, right? There's a lot of confusion when it comes to this. If people don't know where the lesion is, right? You don't have to know so much neuroanatomy, but when it comes to actual clinical practice, I think it's very relevant for us to know what I'm about to tell you. If you know this part of the story, your life feels more complete when it comes to stroke. Okay? First, to understand this, we are going to draw the brain. This is a hemisection of your cerebral hemispheres. Then, you have, I'm going to draw this here. Midbrain, pons, medulla oblongata. Okay? Now, first off, let's start off with the brain itself. Right? When you look at the brain, how many lobes does it have? <laughs> yeah, two cerebral hemispheres, but it divided into four areas, right? You got your frontal lobe, right? Then you got your parietal lobe, and then you have your temporal lobe and occipital lobe. Now, if you look at this side, this is your lateral facing outwards. What spot is important here that you need to know about? Inferior frontal is going to be your Broca's area. And down here, you're going to have your Wernicke's area. And these two are connected here, right? So, apart from knowing that important fact, next important thing is when you look at the brain, right? Normally, we always draw this picture, right? This is the arms of the person, right? And the legs comes and dangles here. And this is known as the homunculus, right? So, normally, let's first off draw our, what controls your motor function? No, no, what? When it comes to neuroanatomy, I want you to know three important tracks, okay? Three important tracks and one more track which is not so important, but you need to know total four tracks. Three is the most important. What controls motor function? Corticospinal tract. So when you look at your corticospinal tract, it typically starts like this, right? You have your corticospinal tract and typically your primary motor cortex is going to be in the frontal lobe. And here we're going to call this the primary motor cortex. And in the parietal lobe right here, what you're going to have is your primary sensory cortex. Now, both of them are going to have the same homunculus. Okay, the fibers are going to start from there. And all of this has to come and it has to connect, right? So you see fibers are connecting from different parts and they all have to come together at one point. Where does it come together? At the level of the internal capsule. So I want you to remember, once you hit internal capsule, they're all connected together. Then your corticospinal tract is going to descend in your brainstem and it's going to cross at the inferior most pole of the middle oblongata and come down. And typically, this is your cross section of your spinal cord, right? Like this. Yes? It's going to come here to your anterior horn cell and this is going to go out as a second lower motor neuron and you're going to connect the muscle. And this is your corticospinal tract. This is tract number one that controls motor function. Make sense? Okay. So now, we know if the patient has a stroke that's affecting above the internal capsule, you'll either have arms more than legs or legs more than arms. Right? If I ever tell you it's equal weakness of arms and legs, it has to be internal capsule and below. Right? It has to be internal capsule level and below. Can you get a separation at this point? No. Once it's connected, it's one wire. 
above it it's a branch right so that's the important thing you remember so corticospinal tract is your tract number one so whenever you think about it what controls what supplies blood to the lateral part of the brain here is your MCA okay middle cerebral artery is what's going to supply this lateral aspect what supplies your medial aspect of your brain is going to be anterior cerebral artery okay so when you look at MCA stroke you'll have arms more than legs ACA stroke you'll have legs more than arms internal capsule and below it's going to be all of them make sense okay now when it comes to a stroke if I have a person who's got a stroke at the level of say internal capsule right upper and right lower are both weak right equally what would happen to tone when you examine the patient is it an increased tone or is it very flaccid internal capsule increased. increased what would happen to my reflexes it'll be increased okay what if I told you the patient had a spinal cord cross section okay acute well well, say the patient's got a spinal cord cross section, right? And you cut this part off, right? What would happen to the tone to the affected side? Would it be elevated or low? low. It'll be low. What about your reflexes? It will be low. Now, why is that? What is the reason for it? So, let me put it this way. Whenever I say you're going to cut your spinal cord, right? You're essentially taking off. Anytime you take off your anterior horn cell, this is your anterior horn cell and lower motor neuron. Your lower motor neuron and your anterior horn cell, if you take this out, you're completely cutting off connection to the muscle. And if you don't have any connection to the muscle, of course you cannot have tone. And you cannot have reflexes. So decreased tone, decreased reflexes for lower motor neuron lesion. It will be decreased tone and decreased reflexes. Okay. Apart from that, what else would you also see? The muscles will be flickering. What do you call those? Fasciculations. Why? Imagine if nobody cares about you, nobody talks to you, what happens? You start earning for, you get so excited, just please stimulate me, right? So you get upregulation of receptors such that anything can trigger some form of contractions because you're not stimulating the muscle and that's why you end up with fasciculations, okay? That's why you end up with fasciculation. So it's very important for you to understand why you get a lower motor neuron lesion and why you get the features with it. Now when it comes to upper motor neuron, the truth is this upper motor neuron is bringing inhibitory fibers to your lower motor neuron. It's bringing an inhibition to it. It is connecting it, but it's still bringing inhibitory message. So if you have an upper motor neuron, you take away the inhibition on your lower motor neuron. So what would you get? Increased tone. Increased reflexes. So whenever you have an upper motor neuron lesion, you get increased tone and increased reflexes. Okay? That's the important thing that you want to know first. Even reflexes happen in the spine without the brain. So if you cut the brain, reflexes will remain working. What do you mean? Reflexes don't need to go to the brain. You don't have to. You have a reflex arc, but still, whenever you see a patient with an upper motor neuron lesion, you will still have... Because if you look at your spinal cord section, right here is your upper motor neuron. Imagine you have an upper motor neuron that comes, right? At every spinal level, it's giving, right? So you still have an upper motor neuron running there. It's not like upper motor neuron is not involved in a reflex arc. Upper motor neuron still comes through. Because if I draw the brain like this, and this is your spinal cord, right? You will have your corticospinal tract run all the way through. And it's giving lower motor neuron at every level. You see? So it's not like it stops up there. It's running through the whole thing. So whenever you do a spinal cord cross section, this is upper motor neuron. This is your lower motor neuron. Okay? So whenever you have an upper motor neuron, you will have increased tone. You will have increased reflexes. That is basic understanding. Got it? So we understood our corticospinal tract. Makes sense? Okay. So whenever you have above internal capsule, there will be a difference between arm and legs. Internal capsule... It'll be equal. Then you come to your brainstem. What is going to be very unique if you affect the brainstem? Well, what does the brainstem have that's very important? Cranial nerves. Depending on which part of the brainstem that's affected, 
that specific cranial nerve is going to be affected, right? So the cranial nerve is going to tell you where the lesion is, okay? Now again, when you look at this, normally you see your corticospinal tract crosses to the opposite side. So it's always going to be a contralateral hemiplegia when it comes to corticospinal tract, right? Okay. Now, we've got to understand three more tracks, okay? The next tract we are interested in is what? So you've got spinothalamic tract, right? Spinothalamic tract's job is what? It is pain and temperature, right? It's pain and temperature. So I'm going to draw it in red for spinothalamic. You've got pain and temperature that comes this way. This is your first nerve fiber. That's first. Then from here, what happens next? It immediately crosses to the opposite side. Okay? And then it climbs all the way up. Okay? Comes to the internal capsule level and goes into your primary sensory cortex. Okay? This is going to be, so this is nerve one, this is nerve number two. Nerve number two has to stop here. Okay? And then you get nerve number three to go up. This is not important for you to know so much. Important thing is no spinothalamic tract's job is to cause pain and temperature. It comes through the spinal cord and it's going to run through the lateral part. So we're going to call this the lateral spinothalamic tract. So we got one track in the lateral, we got one track in the medial, corticospinal. What's the next track we're interested in? What controls vibration, proprioception? It is dorsal column, right? Your dorsal column. So when it comes to your dorsal column, which is your third important track that we need to know about, is this is your dorsal column, which controls vibration, proprioception. It comes through your dorsal root ganglion from the back here comes to this part here, climbs up here, okay, meets its next nucleus and then essentially follows your corticospinal tract and then ends up here and then again from internal capsule goes all the way, okay. Now you see you have two tracts that are running medial which is corticospinal and dorsal column and on the lateral side you got your spinothalamic tract. Now, the fourth important track, which is not as important as these three, but there's one more track that runs in the lateral aspect. We are going to call that the hypothalamic tract. Okay, we're going to call this the hypothalamic tract. What's the hypothalamic tract's duty? It has got to do with your sympathetic chain. Remember, you have a sympathetic chain that supplies your eyes. Okay, the sympathetic chain has to have sympathetic response to the eyes, right? So if ever you mess around with sympathetic chain or hypothalamic, you're going to cause a problem with the patient's eyes. Okay? So now, very simply, two tracks medial, two tracks lateral. Great? Now let's fill out our brainstem. Okay? When it comes to your brainstem, what cranial nerves are present in the midbrain? Three and four. Now the way you're going to do it is, if it is a pure motor cranial nerve, it's going to be medial. If it's mixed, let's put it in the middle. If it is sensory, put it in lateral. So when you look at three and four, are they what? Three is a mixed, okay? So three is going to be, let me use a different color. So it's black maybe, yeah? Okay. So midbrain, you're gonna have three, which is a mixed, and then you have four, which is a purely motor. Three, four, what do they do? They control your eye movements, right? SO4, LR6, rest of the muscles of the eye is by 3, right? So 3 is in the middle, 4 is going to be medial. When it comes to your pons, what do we have? You have 5, 6, 7 and 8, okay? Now 5 is a mixed, okay? 6 is purely motor, right? 7 is mixed and 8 is purely sensory. It is vestibular cochlear nerve. So eight, important thing for you to remember, is you have it like this. The, the vestibular portion dips into the medulla oblongata. Okay? So this is going to be your eight. Okay? Now, finally, when you come to medulla oblongata, what do you have? You have nine, ten, and twelve. And what do you have? Nine and ten are going to be, what are they? Nine and ten is purely motor, right? Because it supplies what? Your muscles that you swallow. 
right? So 9 and 10 are going to be mixed. Now what about 12? It supplies your tongue. It's purely motor. So it's going to be medial, okay? So once you have this arrangement now, right? When would you tell me the patient's got a stroke effect in the midbrain? If the patient has 3 and 4 cranial nerve involvement. When would you tell me the patient's got a stroke affecting the pons? When you have cranial nerves 5, 6, 7 or 8 affected. When would you tell me the patient's got a stroke that is affecting the medulla oblongata? When the patient's got effect of your medulla oblongata 9, 10 or 12. Right? Now, so that's basic simple. If you know this, you know when you're examining your patient, okay, where exactly is the stroke? Okay? It doesn't change your management as much, but it's important for you to know to suspect where the stroke possibly is. Okay? This was probably much cooler back in the day when we didn't have all these tests that we were doing. So people relied on a full-blown neurologic exam to diagnose where the stroke was. Every view builds your brain. Locked in yet? Watch it again.